ostensibly we're here talking about kind of what we're, we're doing at the moment. We both announced new tours. I, annou I announced a new... Uh, I'll, I'll show you the tour. I'll show you the posters, people. Uh, we both announced tours. And I think it's of interest purely because I quite like what I do for a living. Mm. I, like get, I work all the time because that's me. And then I'll show you Frankie. Um, Frankie, your tour is called The Last Days of Sodom. Yep. What, yep. what was the last one called? Uh, what was it called? I have no idea. I've actually wiped it from my mind. It, it, it was called, uh, I, would like to, I would happily punch every one of you in the face. <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah. just, it just strikes me as a, a kind of a wonderful thing that, sort of an ironic thing that you don't like talking in public mm -hmm. and you don't like people. Yeah. And yet your job is talking to people in public. Yeah. <laughs> I hate people. And now people come up and talk to me. That's how bad it's got. Yeah, no, I actually, I started out uh, writing jokes as a kind of line writer. I actually started for you, working, yeah, working on for distraction, you on distraction. Yeah. So um, years ago, there was a, there was a guy called um, Ian Morris, who we both knew, who now writes The Inbetweeners, who was a mutual friend, and, and we were writing on distraction. I don't know if anyone ever saw that. The kind of crazy quiz show, we used to smash things up, and we used to get stuff from, from Frankie and a guy called Jim Muir. We sort of had you there for vibes. <laughs> You were very much the, the bez of the 8 out of 10 cats well, writing room. That's, I'm happy to be that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I kind of drifted into the kind of telly side of it by, by accident and, uh, uh, and the whole kind of live performing, because I would have happily just stayed a writer, a line writer. That's it's, it's the side a, of it I love. It's another thing that, that I suppose that's what we sort of have in common slightly. I mean, we, you know, you don't like performing. I, I absolutely love it. It's kind of my whole life is performing. But the, um, the, the idea of being kind of a 50s style like joke writer. Because like, yeah. we write jokes, and that's not that common these days. Mostly it's the, the artifice of coming up with observational comedy, and ours is it's just wordplay and just messing around. Yeah, but it's an amazing job to have that you, you're just spending your time trying to think of surprising ways for sentences to end, you know? And you sit in a room and people bring you donuts, and, you know, it, it, then you get to go and say it live. But the actual saying it live part of it, I just find really uh, distressing, almost. You know? We've talked about this before, like the idea that you would write, you would end up writing a show if you could you would write a show good enough that it would be, they're almost like magic words. It's almost like a, like a spell mm -hmm. that you could just say those words with almost no performance and it would be, like, it would work. You yeah. say those words and somehow people have a reaction and they laugh and it's a weird sort of thing where you don't, because you see some comedians, I'm quite, uh, quite in awe of comedians with very poor material mm -hmm. that do, <laughs> no, because the, the amount of performance, sometimes you see someone and you go, this guy's got nothing, Jesus, he's working his <laughs> arse off. Those are the best comedians. He's, just got, he's got to do that every night. He's got to go and say that in Newcastle on a Friday. Imagine the energy he's going to have to put behind this piece of shit. <laughs> yeah, mentioning no names, but there are some extraordinary talents out there. Mm. So what's the, you seem much happier now post, because that, that world, and I like to think I was responsible for your misery, but getting... <laughs> Getting into kind of, uh, you know, Mock the Week and becoming a performer and doing the stand-up tours and, and, you know, and the two DVDs that you've done uh, and that sort of thing, you've kind of come out the other side of that now. You're kind of doing, it seems yeah. you're doing less on TV now. You seem much happier in yourself. Um, yeah, much happier. I really found, uh, like, the, kind of the, works, the workload. I mean, no one likes to hear about how much people work in, right? Uh, but it was, it was just really depressing, like, <laughs> how, much, how much effort went into that. And now I'm kind of doing some other things that I enjoy. I'm writing a, a comic strip. I'm um, hopefully writing some more comics and stuff like that, and, and it's 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 harder for me. I mean, it's much more uh, challenging in a way than 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 just writing lines. But uh, I'm certainly enjoying it a lot more. Yeah. And, and but you're doing, and yet you're going out on the road again. You're going to do another another tour. Yeah, but I'm literally doing sort of half a tour, like till I just have enough money to retire. I literally <laughs> just stop in Carlisle or something. <laughs> There's like 33 dates on it at the moment, and it, it, you know it won't it won't be a massive. Too. It's an interesting thing, though, that, that, that you know the way that you talk about it. I, you know, I I know Frankie from for ten years now, whatever since we did you know distraction together. I've known you a long time, and you're you know you're very kind of amiable, friendly man, and w and that persona on stage of really holding the audience in in just in contempt, yeah. and yet you care so much about how good the show is. You yeah. care about every joke working and and it being a good show. It's a, it's a sort of a perverse thing because I've seen a lot of comedians that do shows just to cash in, and it's just a piss poor show. Uh -huh. And yours is a very, I mean, if you like that kind of, if you like brutal <laughs> jokes about a broken world, you are in luck. I, don't, I just don't see the point of doing anything if you don't do it properly. So that whole idea of people doing things as a cash in just seems to me to be absolutely, why would you bother? Why don't you just go do something else? You know? Uh, 
but I've sort of got to the end of, of how far I can go with that kind of thing. It's on. We were chatting about the um, we were chatting the other day about what you what you end up what you can do live as opposed to what you can do on TV. And obviously there are constraints on TV from producers and channel controllers, but also constraints about if you're on television, you're a guest in someone's home, ultimately. And there's certain things that you can get away with saying and certain things that you, you, know, that you feel like that's too much. And so the DVDs over the years, uh, and, the, and the books certainly, when people are literally buying into your stuff, it feels to me like you can you could take it a lot further. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's also the other side of it, is that because we've both done a lot of telly for the last sort of five years or something, that it uses up a lot of your cleaner stuff. So people watch your DVD, and obviously the stuff you're doing in the DVDs is often the stuff that didn't make it uh, to TV. And uh, often the reason it didn't make it is it's a lot harsher. So people watch your video and go, wow, this guy's absolutely nuts. You know? <laughs> that's, that's a kind of uh, neglected... Uh, it's that idea of like the more brutal stuff, because obviously the other stuff does go into... Like, if I write a two-hour show, I reckon I've got a 10-minute Raw Variety set in that two-hour show of like a couple of clean bits where I go, oh, I could not swear in that bit, and maybe that, that joke's okay. It's sort of, it's a little bit rapey, but not massively. <laughs> it sort of feels like a friendly sort of thing. I mean, even the clips for like something like the in-store the in tonight, because obviously there'll be some younger people in, so the in-store, we had to get like cleaner clips of the show. Right. We'll show a clip and we can, we'll rate it afterwards. Let's a touching <laughs> summation of what homosexual life is like. There. <laughs> We're going dancing and having Bacardi pizza. Well, if that was your joke, it would be about. <laughs> yeah, it I would know be, what it would be about. Yeah. But you can't see it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it would involve a sauna. It's great, though. I often think, right, I've got a theory of British comedy, which is that it's all about the voice. So, British comedy starts out as satirising the voice of the establishment, right? So, it's like. Uh, you start out with even the goons, they have all these kind of uh, posh people who are saying ridiculous things. And it goes right down to sort of Chris Morris, you know, just saying ridiculous things as a newscaster and, and stuff like that. And I think you're sort of like the off duty voice. You know, you're, you're the sort of one of those, you're like if you heard uh, an army officer in, in colonial times talking to his mates. Do you know what I mean? It's more like the kind of like, this is, this is where it would be between friends. There, there is a weird thing actually talking about, you know, uh, class and most British comedy is about class and the fact that I sound quite sort of posh. I mean, I'm not particularly, I'm from Slough, but the idea, I think I get a much easier time than you do in terms of offensive material. Because when you do an offensive joke, it sounds more brutal yeah. because you are Scottish. Yeah. And there's no getting away from that fact, Frankie, there's no dressing it up. It's also like you're working class, so maybe you're an idiot and maybe you didn't mean it. You know? <laughs> there's that. There's that's it. Yesterday I got on the train in Glasgow, right? And there's, there's French people behind me and they're lost, right? And they're sort of talking in French and they're trying to ask directions. And a worker that's working up the side of the platform turns around and answers them in French. And I find it really stunning. I mean, even though I'm Scottish and I know some navvies will speak French, right? But it just seemed like, what? This guy's just turned around and, ah, blah, blah, you know, and told them. It's, you know? it, it is kind of a weird thing where, from a comic's point of view of who's telling the joke is such an important thing for a lot of people. Like, the, you know, when people get offended by stuff, they don't get offended by the joke. It's who's telling it. I've, I've heard you talk about um, people wishing that you were a character. <laughs> yeah. Just the most ridiculous <laughs> thing of like going, yeah, but if you, if you wore a funny hat. Yeah, I'd feel better about this. But ultimately, we are sort of characters on stage. It's not like the real... Uh, you know, it's not how it's uh, that's how I am in front of 2,000 people telling jokes, and you kind of that's everything's character. You know, when you're nice to your girlfriend's parents, that's character. You know, there's there isn't an essential you that you go, oh, but that came from the essence of his spirit. You know, like jokes are just possessions. There's also a thing, isn't there, if you can't really defend it because at the point you're defending it, it's not a joke. So, a joke's a thing that people laugh at in a room. You know, it's, it's a contract between people, whereas when you're trying to defend it, it's just this unacceptable thing that somebody said. It's just a weird thing. I often sort of liken it to, I sort of feel a bit envious of musicians sometimes, because a musician could be here, and this, this shop, shop the, uh, the Apple store, could be empty, and they could sing a song beautifully, and it would still work. With comics, there needs to be an audience. It's like, it's like you're the keyboard, and other, we're just doing that on a bit of table unless there's an audience to kind of hit against. That feedback loop is essential. So that thing of like, I'm writing a new show at the moment, I'm writing the new tour, and before I tell an audience the idea, it's not a joke. It's yeah. kind of an idea for a joke, and it's the audience ultimately regulate comedy, because if they don't laugh at a joke, it isn't anything. And the amount of times that, that the actual joke is something you ad-libbed because of the energy of the audience is what, 50% or something for me? Yeah, probably. Mo most of the writing's done on, on stage, I think. 
I like you might have the nub of the idea before you go on stage, and then and then actually how brutal you get with it, and you, you, the reactions of the audiences. Those kind of warm up gigs are really kind of interesting, I think, because you write in a different way. Is your show different this time round because it's not the offcuts of Mock the Week? Because the last two tours have been yeah, yeah, stuff yeah, yeah, that yeah, didn't yeah, totally. make the cut. Totally. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a different show, but it's actually stayed quite uh, quite grim. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually stayed quite brutal. So I'm going to try and. Uh, I'm going to try and lighten up a bit as I, as I kind of go along. But uh, yeah, certainly at the minute, it's ploughing along the bottom of the seabed. Yeah. Well, the, the, the book, I mean, speaking of, of uh, grim and dark, the, the, the book, I don't know if anyone's uh, read uh, Work, Consume, Die. The book is, it's Frankie's uh, columns from The Sun, the, like the last year, a lo load, of, load of the gags from that, which are really sort of, a really good level of quality. It's really funny. And then the central premise is that you have to keep to a certain level of fame, otherwise you are buggered. <laughs> Well, in a literal well, sense. Yeah, that's why you're a pro, Jimmy, and I'm here in a T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's yeah. a really because it's almost like kind of a. Uh, I mean, some of the it, it, it's a it's a it's kind of a work of literature, and then it kind of has a little break and says, right, I'll 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 talk about the royal family for a couple of pages and do some one-liners on that, or the chapter about war, or the chapter about disability, and then it's and then there's kind of a through line talking about kind of a, a, an analogy of of being in comedy being like being constantly abused, <laughs> yeah. which I think is maybe yeah. your experience of it. Yeah, well, I guess it's one way of, uh, it's, it's, it's one way of looking at it. Um, but it's, yeah, it's also just good to, to kind of have a bit of uh, variety in the type of jokes you can write, because I actually sort of got into comedy loving uh, Spike Milligan and The Goon Show and things like that. And, and when I've largely been on panel shows and things like that, so it's been kind of hard to, to write those kind of jokes. So some kind of like uh, dafter. Uh, moments in it. I it's interesting. It. I mean, the other thing, I don't know how many people have, have read it, but the, the other, I mean, it's quite kind of naked lunch. The bits about the, it's quite trippy and quite kind of, mm. uh, it's an interesting kind of, you know, uh, it's, it's an interesting piece of literature, kind of, just it's a very Thanks different writing me. style, I think. Yeah, I how wrote, did you, how did you write it? I wrote it on acid. <laughs> <laughs> and that isn't like, I, that I isn't like a, 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 a shorthand little, oh, it's like on acid, man. No, you wrote on acid. I wrote some bits on acid. Yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> that does come across. Right, cool. Oh, I'm glad. Uh, there's that thing, I read a great thing by Stephen King where he said uh, a thing he tries to do is to protect the first draft and often you can make something a lot more polished and a lot more of a product but you lose the kind of energy of the, the first draft. So I was really conscious writing that to try and keep the wee sort of acid flavour to it uh, and, and, and not make it too much of a product. I kind of find there's a bit of that in the culture now where uh, everyone's trying to get things honed down and going, oh, here we go, this is an acceptable product for you. We've uh, filed the edges off and, and you know, it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of a bit boring, some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, Buy my you actually, home products. You always break <laughs> it up. That's the thing that's always struck me. Are you breaking the stuff up in this one? Yeah, like there's, there's kind of, there's the, I mean, it's, it's like 300 jokes, but they're presented in different ways to kind of keep the rhythm right. Mm -hmm. I think the difficult thing with DVDs is like on a live show, you get that immediate feedback of like being in front of a group of people and you know when people are getting bored. There's kind of a, there's just a sense that you can tell in the room. And on a DVD, trying to get the edit right so that you've got kind of, you do some stuff standing up, like 10 minutes of stuff off the bat, and then you do some stuff with images. And then I do a lot of audience stuff, getting people up on stage and messing around and kind of just trying to mix up the energy in the room, trying to make it more of a, of a show to feel like it's got a bit of a narrative. And somehow you can, uh, you never quite know what you want as an audience, but you know when it's right and when it's kind of not. Do you ever feel frustrated though, because you get to, you can get to something that's an amazing joke and go, well, that's not getting where it should because I've just told 40 amazing jokes. And so that's so. That would never happen in my show, no. Um, <laughs> it does the, happen. The, the level show. of amazing jokes is not <laughs> It's a weird thing where getting the order of the jokes is a really, it's an odd thing of like, I love that idea that I don't know how many people have seen my sort of DVDs or live shows, but the, the idea that you, I could tell a joke after two hours that I could never tell off the bat. If I went out there and tried to tell that joke first, the audience would go, no, I don't, I don't like it. But there's a weird thing where you, you kind of, it's almost like making friends with an audience. It's almost like there's kind of a, a relationship builds up over the course of two hours and there's kind of a trust thing where you, and it becomes like that intimacy that friends have where you can tell a really brutal, horrible joke and you know that your friend is just joking. It's kind of okay. That's your opener. Put it at the top. If they don't like that, they can fuck off. That's how I think. Yeah, hey, how's that working out? It's going okay. <laughs> I'm retiring. <laughs> I can't believe that you'll retire. I don't, I can't, I oh, sort oh, of, yeah, yeah, yeah. I find it an odd thing that you don't like that you've because because comedy is so about ego, you know, so yes. about you know the subtext of all comedy shows you've ever seen is please like me. Mm. 
you know, and, and, and yet you don't seem that fussed about whether people like you. It's a very odd thing. It's very kind of, it's very much the id, not the ego that you work with. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the last show was supposed to actually be about the id. I don't know if anyone watched that video, but like uh, I come on at the start and I shout, uh, I'll show you the life of the mind. You know, the John Goodman character from Barton Fink. And the idea was what would we do if, what show would I do if there was no restrictions from the, the super ego going, oh, don't say that. You know, which there's is rarely anyway kind of thing. So, so but I think I think we did. We definitely lost that guy. We lost so, him at Super Eagle. So what? Like, what would you say? What? So what Frankie's saying is the show would be. You look totally fucking lost, man. I will just tell you. So what Frankie's saying is, what would the show be? What would the stand-up show be if you didn't care what anyone thought about you? And most comics are obsessed by approval. So there's something horrible missing from our lives. Tough childhood. Something. Something horrible happened. So we desperately need to be liked by strangers in a shop. I think on I a think... Monday. <laughs> You explaining that has made him understand it less. Are you Scottish, man, or are you just you just have You've definitely to be... got the look. Are you applying? <laughs> <laughs> you look so ginger, you could get skin cancer from a crescent moon. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he cares what we say. Is that if he's mind on shortbread and heroin? <laughs> <laughs> I, but kind of, I mean, it's, it's okay to recognise that, kind of like, so comedy's a kind of narcissistic thing, but you kind of got to move on from that as well and go, well, let's get away from being a narcissist, let's, let's forget about the ego, because probably the ego, as we've developed it, isn't for that, it's probably something that uh, we should get rid of. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it's a really important thing in, in kind of why. I mean, it's a weird thing that the job that we do, not only are we, you know, well remunerated and we, you know, people come to gigs and it's a big thing doing stand up now, it's like the status seems totally at, at odds with what we do for a living. We just write jokes. Mm -hmm. They're just silly little things, just, you know, and it makes it, the only reason to do shows is, is to release endorphins and to make people happy for two hours if they come and see us. And there's a weird thing where it gets written about in The Guardian. You just think, Sort of a waste of ink. We're just trying to make people laugh. Yeah, I never read reviews. Like they just seem like just you should bonkers. read some of mine, man. They're excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I just I always find that it's a bit like if you know it's some comedy Craig did that didn't like you. It's a bit like someone saying to me, uh, "My dog barked when you when you came on TV." That's kind of the level I uh, kind of attribute to it. It's just sort of who cares what some guy thought? Some guy I don't know. Well, well maybe we should open it up to questions. What do you think? Have you has anyone got any questions? Any thoughts? Like who? Give us examples of uh, people you couldn't care less about in comedy. Uh, pretty much all of them. Uh, I mean, present company excluded, of course. My opinion yeah. oh. <laughs> means the world to Frankie. Yeah, yeah. I know there's loads of comments I really love. I really love uh, Doug Stanhope. I went to see him when he was in London last time. He was brilliant. I tell you, uh, I love uh, like American stand-ups like that maybe people haven't heard of because it's pointless us recommending people that you already know are good. But yeah. there's a guy in America called Anthony Jesselnik. Oh, who yeah. I just think is extraordinary. He's, right. he's on the roast of Charlie Sheen. He just does a tiny bit on that. But if you get a chance, his Comedy Central special is e exceptional. He's just a brilliant comic. And if you like the kind of stuff that Frankie and I do, it's that kind of it's the same ballpark. And uh, a, a, a slightly different type of comic, Maria Bamford, who's uh, an American com comedian and, and just like the best comedian in the world. I think she's she's extraordinary. Yeah, and yeah. she does a lot of voices and a lot of messing around. But I mean, if that if you take anything away from today, download some Maria Bamford and some Jesselnik. I mean, yeah. she's extraordinary talents. Louis C.K. I rate as one of the best yeah. in the world as well. I mean, I know I think a lot of people are already at that party. But if you haven't seen him, he's amazing. And Bill Barr, if you've not seen Bill Barr, he does actually a free podcast every week as well. It's just absolutely bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. He's like an angry ginger guy. How come you yeah. like him? Yeah, yeah. He has, he has actually. He has a brilliant comment. Yeah. Any other? Any other? I mean, you can ask us anything. <laughs> oh, Spider Man, you got a question. <clears throat> um, have either of you ever regretted telling a joke at all? Uh, I don't. I don't think. I mean, <laughs> I. I, do, I have actually. No, I have actually regretted. A few things, but they're not sort of the ones you would imagine. Kind of thing. There's always like, you like, you can never be like perfect on thinking about it, right? But certainly, I did a TV show in. <laughs> I try. <laughs> I did a TV show in Scotland, right? And there was at the time there was an advert that was uh, a health advert in Scotland uh, saying "Speak to your kids more," right? 
and uh, I did a, a routine about what a kind of stu- what a kind of stupid advice they're giving us now, right? And I, and I really regretted it when I thought about it because I thought that's exactly the advice that people need. It's exactly uh, bad parents, one of the big problems in Scotland. And, and probably some guy steered that through a bunch of meetings, and went, "No, no, that's what we need to do." And then I'm just turning up, going, <laughs> you know, I really, I really did regret that. And there's a feel like that, you know. When you think I don't know. Well, I think that's kind of okay though, because even if you make a joke of it, it makes just more awareness of it. I wouldn't, you know, I think it's uh, just that thing if it's out there in the ether. To talk about these things. I mean, in terms of regret, I don't, I don't think so. Because it's a weird thing where you can pick the joke. I could pick a joke that I've got into trouble with in the press and say, so, well, I wish I hadn't told that. But that could have been, there's probably maybe 10 or 20 jokes on the DVD, on the new one, that could be front pages of the Daily Express if they chose to go after me. If they said, look, I, you know, this guy, it's his turn. Let's get him. There's loads of jokes they could pick. And, they, you know, they didn't pick unreasonable ones. The ones that they picked are a fair summation of the kind of work I do. And I think you've got to stand behind it and go, well, that's the sort of thing I say. If you don't like it, I'm fine with that. I always look at it and think they could have literally picked any joke. You just let it they all like that, you know? And they sort of go, oh, that particular thing. Ah, naughty man. <laughs> <laughs> Get the DVD. You've got a year's worth of stories ahead of you. <laughs> Yeah, I did a thing. I, it's weird the ones that don't get picked on. Some, sometimes you, you tell a joke and you think, oh, I might get into trouble for this, but I just sort of, oh, I'll say it anyway, I don't care. And then there's nothing. I did one about Jimmy Savile the other day. Like, literally, he'd been dead two hours. <laughs> and I said, oh, Jimmy Savile, the presenter of Jim Will Fix It, has died. I guess he finally got round to reading my letter. <laughs> nothing. They couldn't care less. <laughs> it's just weird sometimes how... You know, it's never the ones you expect. Um, <laughs> Oh, should we have another question? That's, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, sure, from, from over there. Uh, Jimmy, you obviously really enjoy the live performance side of it, and for the last few years you've been touring pretty relentlessly. Is that something you plan to do for the next 20 or 30 years, or do you have other things you're going to work on otherwise? I or? think so. I mean, I think so. I really like the comics that I really kind of aspire. I mean, George Carlin we just mentioned, but George Carlin, someone like that, or Billy Connolly, someone that's, for me, sort of being a, a comedian, that kind of journeyman thing of going, well, this is my job, and I'll keep on doing this and coming up with shows. As long as I can do it, I'll, I'll do it. I mean, it's the, it's the polar opposite of, of, uh, of Frankie. I mean, I, I think, I don't know what the motivation is there. I think there's just a, just a weird personality disorder that I've exploited. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to just keep on doing it. So I'd like to keep on doing it. And I fi- kind of found a core audience now. I think I maybe offend less people now because there's a core audience that go, I'll just go, I'll go and see a show. Like they come and see it once every 12 months and they buy the DVD every year. And it's, once you've got that kind of core, you can kind of relax a little bit. People kind of come back and, and you're preaching to the choir, so to speak. People get that it's a joke and they get you just messing. And it's a, but it's a nice but thing. don't you get knackered? Because I just find I get halfway through those tours and I'm just absolutely a physical wreck and... Slightly nuts. <laughs> don't you? Don't you just? Does it ever get? To? Not so much. I mean, I really. I don't know. I don't have kids though, so I think that's a big. Yeah. So my my. I just. I mean, I I kind of uh, live to work, while, rather than work to live. I got nothing else going on. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. Yeah. Just got some jokes. Please like me. It's tragic when you say it like that, though, isn't it? This is like being interviewed or doing this kind of thing. It's like it's such sort of. It's just cheap therapy for us. Well, so was your, was your question basically, when will you stop? <laughs> Please, for the love of God, stop touring. Enough already. I put dates in for Christmas 2013 the other week. <laughs> I basically put them in the future. Any other, any other questions we could... When you tour the country, do you have to change your routines as opposed to where, what part of the country you're in? Like, would you do something different in Wales as you would sort of in Scotland? Not, not in the least. I've never found that you change it anywhere. People have different areas of what they will and won't accept, but I, I pretty much I do a very similar show and I write some jokes about the town usually. I, I, I find it's nights of the week, nothing to do with where you are in the country. Right. I find just certainly, you know, kind of Friday night, t- people tend to be super boisterous because they've gone out after work, maybe at six o'clock because they're seeing a show, they've met up with some friends, they've had a few drinks, and by the time the show comes on, by the time I'm on stage at eight, they're pretty tanked up and, and kind of ready for fun. Saturday nights, they're a bit calmer. Saturday nights are probably the best. Sunday nights are great. Tuesday nights, they've clearly booked it going, I'll go and see him on the 29th. Great, we'll get tickets. Fabulous. And then they arrive and go, it's a Tuesday, and think, well, I want to be watching CSI. What am I doing out? <laughs> Just kind of a bit kind of, I'm not sure how to react. They take a bit more warming up. But I think it's, it's surprisingly uniform. The thing I find really weird is, like, an audience this size, it's probably, what, 100 people here. It's not that many people. But, you, like, as a focus group, audiences have got this kind of... There's a weird crowd intelligence where if a joke works, even in a 50-seater little warm-up room where we do tryouts for tours, if it works with 50 people, it'll work with 2,500 people. And there's a weird 
I find it very odd how the British public have got kind of an identity that, that kind of that, that intelligence of, you know, when I said comics, regu uh, when the audiences regulate comedy, you decide what is and what isn't acceptable, and it's pretty universal, the, re the reaction. Yeah, yeah, it's strangely so. Yeah. I often warm up in like just 50 seaters. But they'll have the same, the same big laughs, laughing yeah. a round of applause, everything will be the same sort of rhythm as it would be in a huge room. Yeah. Oh, you've got a question. Oh, lady, hello, lady. Like, coming off the back of that question, do you have a favourite place in the country to play? Um, yeah, probably, I don't know, it's, it's probably somewhere like, I mean, I really like Liverpool because there's always a slight sense of edge that, because it's got a real reputation as, as a tough place to play and if they love you, they really love you and if they hate you, they can, be, they can be quite harsh. I mean, I did a DVD in Glasgow because people are just mental. Like they're really kind of aggressive audiences and they heckle a lot. And I, I like a lot of audience interaction in the DVD, so you can guarantee you'll get heckled a lot. But I mean, they're all good. I find the, the shit of the town, the better the response. <laughs> there's, there's a weird thing where, not, not, not in that sense of like even shitty, like Inverness is a beautiful town, you know, on Loch Ness, it's gorgeous. If you go there as a comedian, there's a sense of, oh, he's come here. We don't have to travel four hours to see him at the SECC. There's like, people are glad, or you go and play Clacton, you know, somewhere just, or, you know, big up Clacton, yeah, nice. <laughs> but it's a weird thing where, where if you go to a small place, like I do quite a lot of kind of even sub a thousand, like sort of 900 seater gigs, so small regional theatres. Like if you go to Dudley, so I play a lot, I've recorded the, this DVD in Birmingham, but I play Dudley, which is only seven miles away. But I played to sort of a thousand people there in the town hall. And they're so pleased you came because a lot of them are young people that don't drive or people that, you know, it's just easier to get to. And I think they kind of appreciate that. There's a weird sense where people want to go out, but they, some people haven't got the wherewithal to travel as well. So any other? Oh, yeah, there's a, there's, oh, there you go. Yeah, then why not? The mic's right next to you. Do you have a, a definitive moment in comedy where you sort of thought, I am funny, and then... It come off the back of that, if you know what I'm I mean. I'm super looking forward to it. It's going to be... <laughs> well, where I kind of went, oh, I've made it, kind of thing. Not really. I think if you look... Like, I've done seven DVDs now, and if you look at the first one, I look like I have a stick up my ass. I mean, I'm so uptight and nervous, and, you know, performance-wise, you feel like you get better every year, or I certainly feel like my performance changes a little bit, and I'm a bit looser than I was, and a bit more myself. And my stage persona or kind of character is getting closer to who I actually am. And that's kind of an onward going, you know, thing. Hopefully you just get better all the time. But I don't think I'm, you know, I don't, I wouldn't have thought that I'm there yet in terms of, you know, when you look at, you know, you look at someone like, you know, as effortless as George Carlin, you kind of slightly go, well, oh, what's the point of me? I started out being very uptight and then I did a, a show at Edinburgh called The Voice of Black America. And I, I bought a pink suit and I just tried to do it like a black American guy would. Just do the whole show like that. And, uh, well, we were that both, very into, both very into like uh, Dave Chappelle yeah, yeah, yeah. and Chris Rock as like yeah. stand-ups that just are on stage and have got just a certain way about them. Just an, I mean, especially Dave Chappelle, I just think he's got this incredible stage yeah. presence and yeah. charisma and just having fun with it. I mean, having fun with it is really the thing. Kind of sometimes it becomes a job. Sometimes you kind of, you f I find myself like on 8 out of 10 cats or something going, right, got to write these jokes about this subject this week and you're very you know, forced into thing and reminding yourself to be grateful that it's such a fun thing to do. Just to kind of have, and, and having a laugh, because essentially your job is to have fun. Yeah, and to, uh, yeah, and to not take it too seriously, because it's such a stupid thing to do. It's like, oh yeah, this is ridiculous. It is ridiculous, but the status it's afforded as well, and I think that's partly to do with the nature of fame in our society. I don't know how you feel about the thing. I don't know if anyone read the Jonathan uh, Franzen thing about the ache. Did you read that short piece no. he wrote? No. About, the, about how you know, fame has sort of replaced religion in our society. Right. That idea that people, people think, if I'm, like in the way that heaven used to be a thing, people used to want to go to heaven, now people want to be famous. It's kind of replaced it as a thing where people think, well, I'll be all right if that happens. Yeah. So it's, a, it's a weird kind of thing where you get a lot of status just through being a man that says rude things on TV. It's weird. You really feel like you haven't earned it as well. I think that's part of the reason I tour so much. But you do it because that gives you a sense of worth of like, oh, well, I am working. I'm doing something. Even though it's a stupid thing, I'm doing a lot of it. <laughs> you've, you've just made that so terrible. Any other questions? Anything else you'd like to know? You've got, you've got your hand up. That's, I, I will give you a microphone. Give him a microphone. He seems... He has, he has curly hair. Um... Are, are there any like particular topics or areas you, you think are taboo, which um, you you wouldn't? You it's wouldn't very do? yeah. I think they're they're definitely. I mean, I don't know about you, but definitely for me, it's very difficult to make airplane food funny. <laughs> <laughs> it just feels like someone else has got there before. Um, 
flooring is a very difficult area the, the, I've always found. Flooring, well, you could, you know, I think there's there's a, uh, a joke about Hispanics and underlay that you could maybe put together, but yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you on that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's just like, you know, there are taboos, but the question is, do you want to respect them? Uh, I think that... I th- I'm, I'm not interested. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, man. How, 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 how are you going to use it? I see the man behind you. Just like that. <laughs> Just I like want to Re- congratulate the cameraman here who is doing a wonderful uh, job, you know? Because he is. Yeah, this is, yeah. Well, think, well fabulous. That's uh, one of the three weirdest things that's ever happened, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else whose work you're enjoying? Because <laughs> we're How feeling badly? a bit <laughs> How badly is this going? <laughs> but not only that guy was just looking at the cameraman, but that got the biggest laugh. That's, this is going badly, isn't it? I can't wait till you go home tonight and say to your wife, well, uh, <laughs> the cameraman was particularly good. What's, what's, what sorry? Pim, pim, by your colleague. Pim, pim, by your colleague. You're my new favourite human being. Please... Can I get him, uh, you're from the Apple store, can I get him washed and brought to my room? <laughs> I'm joking, don't wash him. <laughs> really hoping he doesn't That's have a gun. That's d- definitely yeah. one of yours. Yeah. <laughs> definitely one of yours. I don't think one he's of one of anybody's. <laughs> take care, take care of the rover. The, take care of the rover, yeah. yeah. We will do. And good night. I don't know if you've got a catchphrase, but take care of the rover. <laughs> if you've learned anything this evening, take care of the rover. <laughs> yeah, he needs something, doesn't he? Anyone, anyone else enjoyed the work of the technical crew? Uh, <laughs> go on. Um, how do you um, feel about hecklers? Um, in particular, you say about like friendship with the crowd. I used to get heckled a lot in the clubs. You know, especially when I would play like the stand in Glasgow or something like I play like rough towns and you know I'd be <laughs> You really need to visit some other towns in the west of Scotland, Jimmy. You need to go. Uh, no, I don't. I go to nothing. <laughs> but but like I have to actively now say, right, we're gonna have a little time out and if you want to heckle something aggressive, we'll do some heckles, we'll have some heckle put downs, it'll be a lot of fun. But literally I have to say it now because people kind of once you've come out to a show, once you've paid twenty five pounds to come to a show, you don't want to mess up the evening for yourself, all the people around you, you don't want to be that guy. <laughs> you wanna feel like you're in a safe place, but sometimes it's fun to shout your mama. It's sometimes it's just fun to shout and it's also the thing in the room is I like the idea that I haven't got the monopoly on being funny like because it's a weird thing with comics you're not on a pedestal I mean we literally are on a pedestal as I say <laughs> but, you're, but people don't look up to us in the same way as they look up if it was a musician up here or a film star people are in awe of their talent and like oh wow they're amazing with comics you sit there and go yeah he's funny but I like that sort of car. I've got the same sort of sense of humour as him or I la- we laugh like that with our mates the most common conversation I have when I meet people after shows is going I've got a mate who's really funny he should do it as well and I want those people to join in in the, in the show and sometimes I'll rinse them a little bit, but not too much. <laughs> God, yeah, you man. had a question as well. It seems to be coming How did, in pants. Um, both of your first gigs go? First mine, mine went really, really well, and then I later found out that crowd had lied to me, and my act was shit. <laughs> <laughs> it just went amazingly well. I thought, I am great at this, and then just burned, burned for the next few. Yeah, I had a really good first gig, uh, like really good five minutes above a pub. Well, it's the thing that people don't really talk about in Great Britain. People talk about people playing the O2 and the comedy store and the theatres that we kind of play. But they don't, the, the stand-up circuit, like, the, 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 like people like above pubs trying five minutes of stuff, we've got the best circuit in the world. It's so easy to get stage time here compared to anywhere else in the world. And those, kind of, those early gigs, people are so supportive. The kind of social thing. If anyone's thinking of doing stand-up, I would strongly recommend you give it a go. Because even if you just try it once and it's a disaster, you'll enjoy stand-up a lot more as a result. But mine was fine. second one was dreadful. Okay, no, we'll it's do my in, birthday we'll do today, to- tomorrow, and I'd really like you to say me um, a happy birthday. It's your birthday tomorrow? tomorrow well, I can't yeah. ask you your age because you're a lady. How much do you weigh? <laughs> <laughs> go on. Seven stone. Yeah. I can't believe you answered that one. Well okay. <laughs> What's, what's your name? Amanda. Amanda? Should, should, we, should we wish Amanda a uh, happy birthday? Of course we should, <laughs> Please. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. 
Happy birthday to you. This is weird. Happy birthday, dear Amanda. Who's Seven Stone? Happy birthday to you. Thank you. Hooray! Cheers. You've definitely made my year. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Cheers.